Hi, everyone. My name is David Macklin. I am a family physician who has worked for now since 2013 exclusively in the field of obesity medicine, managing comprehensive weight management programs focused on both the behavioral elements of treatment and also the medical elements of treatment of this real medical condition. I come to you today as well as a co-author of the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Treatment of Obesity, a co-author of the Psychology and Behavioral Chapter. In our clinical practice guidelines, we describe that obesity treatment has three pillars, behavioral therapy, medical therapy, medication, and surgical therapy. Most people understand what medical therapy and surgical therapy at least are in principle, but what I find is many people are unaware of the processes and details of what is behavioral therapy. And so if that's something that's of interest to you, you've come to the right place. Today, I'm going to be discussing the second of eight modules. We, these are knowledge translations of the information within the psychology and behavioral chapter in the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines. This today is the expectations or second module, the one that we'll be discussing. And the objectives of today's talk are first, you will learn the best weight curve and what that means. And along with it, the science of appetite and metabolism that changes to fat loss. That'll take us about 11 minutes. Second, you'll learn about weight related comorbidities and improvements with obesity treatment. That'll be quick, that's about two minutes. And then finally, and very importantly, we'll create practical clinical experience discussions by discussing and helping you learn how to address expectations using the ask, listen, summarize, invite, inform method, which sits at the center of motivational interviewing. And that'll take us about five minutes. All right. Here you see our expectations curve. This is the universal weight loss curve of the human being. Everyone should have this curve uh, indelibly uh, seared into their mind and, and be able to explain it regularly to patients and other clinicians. What we see in body weight and time is that over time, the weight loss of an individual who is being treated behaviorally, medically, surgically, we'll see that weight loss will begin and eventually will slow and slow and slow and slow and then pull in somewhere flat. And the real question becomes, well, why does that happen? I'm gonna be discussing the well-explained theories and the maintenance of lost weight and long-term management of obesity by uh, a paper, a great review paper by Kevin Hall and Scott Kahn, where mathematical modeling is used to describe why this curve looks the way that it does. Here you see a, um, a graph from the look ahead trial. This was a post hoc analysis of the year one data in this great long term behavioral intervention. And I'm not showing this graph to go into the details of why Rena Wing here created six cohorts, all based on the amount of weight that they lost in the first two months. What I'm describing in this graph is again the shape. See that different cohorts in a behavioral intervention, all losing weight, the shape is the same. Individuals in each cohort, they are losing, and then weight loss slows and slows and slows and pulls in somewhere. So again, why this shape? Here, even with medication, in this uh, clinical trial, which is the uh, diabetes and uh, obesity and uh, pre-diabetes uh, clinical trial using liraglutide versus placebo in uh, determining if a medication is safe and effective for long-term weight loss, here we see, again, two cohorts, one with normal glycemia, one with pre-diabetes, and then each of them within placebo or the control arm. And we see again, the very same shape, even with the initiation of medication versus placebo. So here we see the expectations curve. We see um, now, as I jump into the paper, the, the, the Kevin Hall and Scott Cahan paper, they used a, a theoretical 90 kilogram woman who has lost weight and kept it off for two years. And they show through mathematical modeling that this woman loses weight and somewhere around nine months hits that plateau and is not losing weight anymore. 
And the question becomes, well, there's only two possibilities creating this shape. One is that metabolism is slowing and slowing and slowing until the metabolism is slow enough to meet the overall calorie intake of the individual. Option two is that over time through weight loss, appetite is going up, energy intake is going up, and slowly as the energy intake goes up, it reaches the same as the amount that the patient is burning, and again, it goes flat. And so the question is, which is it? Or if it's um, both, which is more predominant, the effect that's creating the plateau of the curve? Here in this graph, you see uh, through, again, complex mathemat mathematical modeling that's well above my pay grade. We see that this theoretical 90 kilogram woman um, begins her weight loss efforts with a energy expenditure, a total energy expenditure, the entire amount of energy she's expending, which is primarily basal, basal metabolic rate, plus dietary induced thermogenesis, plus physical activity. All combined, she starts with an energy expenditure at 2,600. And very soon, within the first month, we see a drop in energy expenditure down to 2,400 calories a day. But then it's quite flat, not a significant change in energy expenditure in this theoretical 90 kilogram woman who's losing about seven to 8% of her body weight and keeping it off uh, through, a, call it a behavioral intervention, over approximately two years. Here in this slide, we see instead the increase in energy intake. And we start to get our answer to the question because here the woman at the beginning of her intervention is eating intake equals 1800 kilocalories per day. And then you see immediately, even as soon as three months into her weight loss process, this woman is already eating 2200 calories a day on average, a full 400 calories more each day underlying the processes of her weight loss, something is resulting in increased energy intake. And we see even by nine months, that total energy intake is at 2,400 calories a day. <clears throat> and so in this case, a full 600 calories more each day on average that the individual is taking in. And we start to have our answer that between decreases in energy expenditure and increases in energy intake, this, the increased energy intake, seems to be much more complicit in the slowing and slowing and slowing of weight loss and the flattening of the curve. Here's a clinical trial by both Randy Seeley and Kevin Hall furthering this point of appetite increase in response to losses of weight or adiposity. Here, a clinical trial of 153 patients that were treated with Invocana. The SGLT2 urinary glucose excretion results in weight loss, some 300 or so calories each day that the patient is spilling. And we see in this graph that there is, because of calorie deficit, there is this uh, weight loss, uh, change in body weight, somewhere on the order of uh, over a year, three to four kilograms of weight loss compared to placebo. And again, an indication of appetite increase. If we look, the weight loss results in an increased eating above baseline by about 100 kilocalories per day per kilograms lost. And so we see that there is this slow rise in energy intake again, which creates in the same way we saw earlier, a slowing and a slowing and a slowing and then and eventually a flattening. So maybe you didn't know that Invocana and this class of medications results in increased appetite, but it does. Otherwise, if the individual is still spilling sugar, they would continue to lose weight, but for the increased energy intake, which is a consequence of uh, the sensation within the brain, the recognition of the decreased adiposity and weight, which results in increased appetite, slow, steady, increased appetite. And that's why the weight loss again flattens and flattens and stops. And so here we have this concept where we can now understand that there is a slow and insidious and steady increase in appetite as our patients lose weight. And we see in this case, the appetite score in the paper by Cahan and Hall, where they describe that the brain is asking for 2,600 calories a day at the beginning by three months, 3,000 calories a day. And then finally, at the 3,200, number, the appetite, the drive to calories by the nine month point. Really interesting in that the patient therefore 
as a requirement of a level of effort. Remember at the beginning, see if I can make this point. At the beginning, the patient was eating 1,800 calories a day, which means that they were eating 800 calories less than the brain was asking for. Then we saw as time went by at three months, the patient was no longer eating 1,800 calories a day. They were eating 2,200 calories per day, but the brain was asking for 3,000, you can see at three months. So again, the level of effort was taking in 800 calories less than the brain was asking for. And then finally, at the nine month point, where we know that the patient was taking in each day 2,400 calories a day, here the brain is asking for 3,200 calories a day. So again, the level of effort is the patient continuing to take in 800 calories less than they're taking in, which creates the image, the impression within the patient that they're really having the same level of effort. It feels like the same level of effort, even though their weight loss is slowing and slowing and slowing, and in this case, at nine months, stopping. It's a really important point because here in this slide then, it's described that the patient is at a level of effort creating and maintaining long-term a level of effort of 800 kilocalories per day. What does that mean? That means that their level of effort is that they're maintaining their energy intake to be 800 calories less than their brain is asking for. For how long? Well, in this case, forever. And of course, now you start to see why we invite patients to consider putting together a lifestyle that is livable and sustainable and enjoyable, something that they can do long-term because whatever process and level of effort they put forward, that's the process and level of effort that they're going to have to maintain long term. And so back to this, of course, now the clinical scenario where we invite the patient to understand that this flat part of the curve could be called their best weight. And so we start to invite patients to, to consider that they are not in a journey to a weight loss goal or a target weight or an ideal weight or pounds per week, but instead finding their best weight. And we'll explain what that means in a moment. Of course, we know that the percentage of body weight that the patient is able to lose will impact comorbidities. <clears throat> Here, a quick graph of, for example, type two diabetes prevention or remission, dyslipidemia, hypertension, hyperglycemia, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we see percentages of weight loss where the there'll be an impact on this comorbidity based on losses of adiposity and losses of weight by percentage. And we know that with even more modern and effective weight management treatment processes that include behavioral and medical, we know that we might be landing quite regularly with our patients between 15 to 18 to 20 to 22 or greater percent weight loss in a sustained way. And so we look at this graph and see that there, of course, can be in an exciting way to think about this, significant impact on all comorbidities and therefore health and therefore quality of life in our patients as we're able to treat them effectively. And of course, many of you will be familiar with, the, uh, with this graph, but or this slide, but really here it's described that the metabolic, mechanical, and mental consequences to excess adiposity. And the in this uh, graph, the metabolic changes include asthma and gallstones and infertility and gout and cardiovascular disease and stroke and dyslipidemia and high blood pressure and coronary artery disease and elements of atrial fibrillation, interestingly, and heart failure, type 2 diabetes, of course, all the dysglycemia um, uh, consequences, mechanical incontinence, joint disease, sleep apnea, chronic back pain and mental associations between depression and anxiety and also ADHD, decreases in self-regulation skills that happen over time because of inflammation in the frontal cortex, all would be considered consequences or complications of living with excess adiposity. And so what does this all mean clinically? Well, again, in our modules, we are inviting you to consider a process of motivational interviewing, and the four steps in this case, asking, listening, summarizing, and inviting and informing our patients to consider the following. And in this case, we all understand the scenarios where we are asked to listen as we ask about weight loss, where we are now asked to listen to patients describing their concepts around expectations. You know, I feel best reading the orange parts at 175 pounds. What weight do you think will be healthy for me? I know I could be losing more quickly, or I feel, I know I should be lighter. I've been at this weight for weeks. If I only lose this much, I'm not gonna be happy. I think I'm 
plateauing. And I was told I should lose 70 pounds as an example. And of course we listen and then we summarize back key third step of our four steps in our clinical uh, approach to managing expectations in this case. So what you're telling me is, correct me if I'm wrong, you feel best at 175 pounds. You're wondering what would be a healthy weight for you. You feel you could be losing more quickly. You feel you should be lighter. You've been at this weight now for weeks and wondering, boy, if I only lose this much, I won't be happy. And I think you're saying to yourself, I'm plateauing and you've been told you should lose 70 pounds. Is that, is that correct? Again, the listening uh, followed by summarizing confirms for our patients that we have heard them and allows for a clarification also of the information that they've shared. And of course, the fourth step then becomes, and this is the introduction and integration of best weight principles to expectations management. Again, I'm wondering if you would consider the invitation sounds like that. I'm wondering if you consider the weight loss always slows down and eventually plateaus. This becomes our answer after our summary. The, the brain defends against weight loss by increased appetite and slowed metabolic rate and primarily increased appetite. Would you consider that your work is to really discover what is the least amount of uh, discover, practice, iterate, what's the least amount of calories that you could take in on average while still at the same time maintaining a loyalty to the things you enjoy from fun and food and friends and drink and celebration and travel all at a level of effort that you feel is sustainable. Your work is to discover this most modest, livable, enjoyable, loyal to fun lifestyle. And then the next step becomes, if you would, to stand back and let your brain, primarily genetics, and your body tell you where you land. The weight you land at becomes what we call your best weight. Again, we've thrown out target weight, goal weight, ideal weight, pounds per week. Your journey becomes something you have control over, which is addressing your behaviors and finding your most modest lifestyle and not addressing something you don't have control over because our weight is regulated by this million year old weight regulation system that's primarily housed in non-conscious circuitry within the lower parts of our brain. The invitation to find someone's best weight. Of course, here, a script exists as well if you so the best weight is this weight we land at the weight our patients land at when living their most modest and sustainable calorie intake or lifestyle and this becomes a pathway to satisfaction there's a predictor in weight loss when we review the evidence that wild weight loss goals are not determinants of whether someone will succeed long term or not but whether they achieve satisfaction with wherever they land. So satisfaction becomes our job. Our patient's satisfaction with where they land becomes our job. How often should you be reviewing best weight principles with patients? All the time, maybe in every visit. Just a reminder, your brain is gonna defend against fat loss by increasing appetite and decreasing metabolic rate. You're not in control over your weight, you're in control over your behaviors. Would you consider this as a journey to find your best weight? over and over and over again. And then if that's the case, when the weight loss curve slows and slows and pulls in somewhere, the patient says, okay, you told me, um, am I necessarily happy? Maybe not, but I understand this is where I'm landing. And you've told me this many times. Again, a, a hope of achieving a level of satisfaction that is a predictor of long-term success. Thank you very much for your attention.